G'day and welcome to episode 56 and our final episode for India. In the last episode we drove out of the desert, visited a huge fort and checked out the Taj Mahal. In this episode we check out the sites of Amritsar before heading to the border. Stay tuned to the end to catch some tips and our wrap up of overlanding in India. Last night when we arrived in Amritsar we came to a guest house just out of the main town area um, and it's a, I suppose, um, common overlander spot. So there's a few other overlander cars here. I think this one's been parked here for a few months. That's ours, obviously. This is another overlander couple who's here at the moment. And another van just around here. Um, but yeah, it's a beautiful garden. So we're just gonna hang out here for a couple of days before crossing over to Pakistan. Um, I think we can just just get a couple of things done in the car, maybe work on the video and there's um, a few things to check out in this area. So yeah, we've uh, only got a few days left in India before crossing over Pakistan. During our stay in Amritsar, we met up with Fabian and Carolyn who will be completing our China crossing with. We checked out the sites of Amritsar together before heading west. First stop is here, Hamandar Sahib, otherwise known as the Golden Temple. You can probably guess why. It is the pre-eminent pilgrim site of the Sikh religion over 100,000 people visit the temple daily for worship, many very keen to get selfies with the girls. Inside the temple is a scripture of Sikhism which is treated as a living person, a guru out of respect. Each night during elaborate ceremonies the guru is carried to its bedroom and tucked into bed for four hours before returning in the morning, open to a random page and read out for the pilgrims to follow that day. We're making the most of having some space where we can pull everything out of the car just to do a little bit of maintenance before we cross over to Pakistan. So Mark's been up on the roof this morning pulling everything down, doing a little bit of a, bit of a once over. Um, and yeah, just getting, getting some spring cleaning done. Feels good. What are you doing? Uh, I was doing an inspection yesterday, just of everything, and noticed there was a fair bit of grease coming out of this swivel hub, um, which is not a great sign, but check the um, the diff in the hub, the grease and the oil, and the levels seem to be okay, but so much, and the oil, the grease doesn't seem to be contaminated, it's not soupy, it's no water, it doesn't smell like there's any oil in it, um, so maybe just the wiper seal's gone, but uh, yeah. When we get to Islamabad or Pakistan, which I'm looking forward to because they have troopies there, so um, yeah, I'll pull apart the um, the hub then and just have a look at it and just replace the seals. But yeah. This morning, one of my jobs is to give the surfboard bag a little bit of a spruce up, a bit of a makeover because it has seen some better days. So. Yeah, we um, <laughs> we went under a tree on the way south um, from Varanasi to Goa, and yeah, we went under this tree and it just tore to shreds. So we bought some material the other day, and the plan is that I'm just going to clean it up, and then we're going to try and glue the new material on top of it. Um, just yeah, there's no there's no surfboard bags in this part of the world which we can buy. So the original one which we had when we left, left Perth that Mark had already repaired. From going under too many mango trees um that one was replaced when we're in bali but yeah so this is this one so yeah hopefully i can do an okay job before we're leaving india we have to visit the wagga border um, which is the border from india to pakistan closing ceremony um, so we're just on our way out there now and everybody has excluded me from their little blue club. So Mark's wearing blue, Carolyn's wearing blue, Fabian's wearing blue. <laughs> and the driver. And, and our driver's wearing blue. And we are driving because... Just didn't read the memo. Because it's <laughs> cheap and it's not worth packing the car up. It's only yeah. down the road. Yeah, between four people it's pretty cheap. Um, so yeah, we're just nearly here now. We're just pulling up and you can see the flags out the front. They're massive.
Believe it or not, this is the ceremony held every day to signify the closing of the India-Pakistan border. For the last 60 years, almost every day, the Indian Border Security Force, otherwise known as BSF, has competitively marched off against the opposing Pakistani rangers. Those steel gates mark the Radcliffe Line, the line drawn to separate the now Pakistan and India during the partition of 1947. Although the border is open daily between 10 and 4, the gates remain closed and are only opened when people need to cross and for the ceremony. On each side of the line is a stadium for spectators to catch the event. This side, the Indian side, can hold around 20,000 very patriotic people and with the close proximity of the stands has the feel and energy of a major sporting event. Apart from the colours, both the BSF and Rangers wear a similar dress and proceed to carry out their seemingly aggressive march against each other, which consists of some very choreographed and coordinated goose steps and ground stomps. The marching proceeds for about an hour before their respective flags are lowered and then the gates reclosed. So our time in India has come to an end and this morning we are going to Pakistan. We're actually going to the Wagga border which is the same place where we went to watch the ceremony. Um, and This time not with... Fabian and Carolyn are coming to <laughs> Are you excited? <laughs> <laughs> I, I see you put blue on again. Yes, uh, blue is for um, border crossing. <laughs> and I got the memo today. Kind of. <laughs> um, so we'll cross the border and then drive to a fort, which is about 40 k's past that. 40 k's, 200. 40, 200. <laughs> about, same thing. <laughs> closing ceremony the other day. Um, yeah, it's one o'clock now. If we had have come like maybe an hour and a half later, it would have been actually packed. But we weren't sure if they would have actually driven us through here when all the people were here. Um, so yeah, we're just at one last check post and they're checking passports again and all the documentation. And then we're going to cross through the gate. this episode and also for our time in India. Before we leave India and Southeast Asia to an extent we wanted to give a bit of a rundown of our time in this beautiful country and a bit of advice to other overlanders thinking about taking the dive and exploring like we have. Our intention isn't to scare anyone away from overlanding India though if you see our videos and want to give it a go we simply want to make sure we're painting the full picture. Hello. Yeah that's right so obviously in our videos we try and paint a, a positive image of, of the countries we go to but if you are coming if you are planning to come here we don't want you to just watch our videos and think that there's not a lot of work which goes behind the scenes of um of doing what we do here so i guess starting off in the last few episodes you may have noticed that we've put more emphasis on the driving styles and conditions which you may face in india um, this is not something to be underestimated and does require a bit of mental preparation um, if you've driven through southeast asia for the last few years like we have uh, this driving in India is just another uh, adaption to the already vastly contrasting driving style which you may experience at home. Uh, if you're driven from the West though, um, coming in from Pakistan or even from, from China, this will come as a bit of a shock to you. So my advice is just take it slow, uh, have an open mind and just go with the flow. From my experience, driving in Asia is to some extent more fluid than driving uh, for example at home in a congested traffic because lanes don't really exist people just kind of adapt to the situation and the traffic just seems to go around obstacles and and just finds a way so um, yeah just 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 go with it and I know that that may sound um, easier said than done when you're driving down a road a, a 
two lane road and there's a truck which decides to overtake another truck in front of you coming straight towards you at 80 kilometres an hour. But I didn't freak out at all. No, not at all. <laughs> um, from our experience, they will never do that without giving you sufficient space to either pass on the shoulder or just pull off the road completely. So, um, yeah, so in those situations, just, just go with the flow and... It can be confronting, but just accept that that's the way it is. Um, Everyone just sort of moves like it just it just happens, yeah. and and <laughs> we have had comments like saying that oh that was close, but really I think the general rule in a lot of Southeast Asia, if there's two lanes with a shoulder, it's generally three lanes. Um, so don't be overcome by the fact that people double overtake in front of you on a two lane road. Just just go around them. It's just um, it's just something you just needs to be. Uh, in the back of your head, and just you just just go with it. So I guess the other major part about our time in India is um, the camping experience that we had. So yeah, so I'm the the planner. Uh, Mark's the driver. I'm the planner. So basically, we had an amazing experience in India with the camping. Though it's definitely not without hours and hours and hours of research looking up places that we could camp. Um, so basically, the way that I'd go about it is. I'd look at where we were driving for a day and maybe I'd do that like for, you know, a week's time sort of thing. Um, but generally for one day of driving, I'd maybe spend about three hours looking at the route and then figuring out where it was that we were going to be camping that night and then looking in that general area for between like 30 to 50 kilometres between places of places that we could camp um, just to make sure that we had a backup plan. Um, but, yeah, and then also cities, like I'd also look up... Um, because obviously in a you know vehicle like this, it's not practical to set up the roof because that just, yeah. You, Tracks too much. <laughs> it's just not, yeah, it's not a good idea. Um, and then, so I'd look up um, a hostel or a guest house which had, uh, had parking and then I'd contact them just to make sure it's okay so that we weren't arriving and just assuming that it was going to be okay. Um, and then if it wasn't, we'd have to drive around the city unnecessarily. So. Which isn't very fun. <laughs> yeah, so the, the, just to expand there, the searching for the parking, like I know you can look online and they may list that they've got parking, but a lot of the research actually involved looking on Google satellite and actually looking at looking through the photos the photos and, that other people yeah. post and the satellite images of the, the size of the parking and then the access restrictions which may be evolved so there was a lot even like although we did jolly did a lot of research into the the, the um wild camping this same amount of effort went into the, yeah. the city as well because like it, coming to india you're still going to go to the cities and see the sites in the cities and experience that culture and the architecture that the country's rich for um, so yeah, that was just all part and parcel of coming to India. Um, but yeah, before we came to India, we I'd read like countless blogs and also spoken to other over, overlanders. And from all that research I'd done, I'd found out that there's this really bad stigma around India that it's really dangerous to wild camp and that it's just yeah completely unsafe. And from our experience, we had the polar opposite experience it was we never felt unsafe for a second um obviously there might be some areas which are unsafe but that's not to say that there isn't in every single other country in the world so yeah you can't just point the finger and say it's just this country um but we just applied the same principles that we've applied for every other country that we've camped in um we've scouted spots on the satellite view and then um, if we don't want to bring attention to ourselves we just wait until the sun's going to set to to you know set up camp and you know not bring all that attention to us so um, because of that we've never ever had a bad time we've never um, like sometimes a local might come and say hi but they're just curious and they're just friendly but yeah we've so far um, had really good experiences so that's been really awesome yeah it's been good so the other, I guess, thing is which we weren't aware of is, and I did touch on it in the previous episode, was the amount of toll roads in India. Um, these range from, say, eight-lane expressways, um, which can either be completely vacant or, depending on the cost, or um, very congested, down to just um, two-lane remote outback roads, all of which you still need to pay for. And in most instances, there's no other way around it. Not to say this is a bad thing, it's just what we didn't expect. Um, and they also vary in condition. At the time when we travelled through India, there is huge road upgrade progress um, going on. So 
even the good roads <laughs> weren't that great. There's just heaps of road work. Lots of road yeah. works, but I guess if you are looking to travel through India in five years' time, you, oh, it'll be it's going to be a bliss. Dream, yeah. <laughs> um, generally, in saying that, we often use <laughs> we prefer to travel off road, anyways, away from the expressways, but. I um, think India is not exactly a country where finding completely off-road tracks is, is something which is achievable, but the roads will be good very shortly. But uh, yeah. back to the point, <laughs> in total, I think in India we spent... Well, like, so in India we drove about 10,000 kilometres um, and we spent uh, Aussie dollars eighty seven fifty, um, which was actually less than what I thought it was going to be. I kept all the receipts for all of the toll roads, but I think because we were just constantly handing over, like it was twenty rupees or fifty rupees or whatever it was, so yeah. it felt like a lot. But when I added it up, it was yeah eighty seven dollars fifty. So yeah, so I guess in saying that, we probably went on about seventy to eighty toll roads from that because they usually range around a dollar some do go up i think the most expensive was from was like agra eight, to eight delhi or something, yeah. was like yeah around that so um yeah so that's that's i think the the th i guess the two things to take out of that was the camping uh, advice and and driving which apart from those two there's obviously the cultural experience which you encounter um there's the as with the, a lot of asia there is um a lot of rubbish which is just unavoidable, but I mean, it obviously is avoidable, but it is there. And to get bogged down on and and getting taking it yeah. to heart that it it's really dirty. I mean, you ha you have to look past past that stuff and you know what you're getting in for when you come to India. Yeah, that's right, India. Yeah. What it is, and it's a cultural experience, and keep an open mind. And um, there is a lot of beauty in the country, and and I think it it's there for the people who who are willing to put the effort in to find it, um, like we did. And, and we really liked it. Yeah. When when we first left Australia, we got some, uh, uh, just a small word of advice from uh, this guy in uh, Timor Leste, Adam, and he said that we should never paint an Eastern world with a Western mindset. And it's so true because you just have to accept the country for what it is and embrace its culture and the good and the bad and just go with it. And, and you're going to, you know, hear people's bad experiences and not it's not for everybody and if no, some people will love it and some yeah. people will absolutely hate it i don't think there's a really in between for india it's just love or hate, <laughs> love or hate. Um, um but you have to go and make your own opinion you can't just go based off somebody else's opinion. yeah we, we, we were guilty of potentially falling into that um sort of negative mindset yeah. based off what people were saying leading oh, up to sure. arriving in india and and we were really disappointed in the fact that we let ourselves succumb to the, those opinions um, without finding for ourselves. So the only thing we can kind of urge other people to do who do want to travel like we do is keep an open mm -hmm. mind, take people's opinions, even ours, what we're saying now, is an opinion and let yourself decide on when you yeah. arrive. But yeah, do it, putting the work in, the research, is 100% worth it because we had an amazing experience. It was an amazing few months in India and... Yeah, we loved it. So thanks, India, for having us. It was absolutely unreal. And thanks to everybody <laughs> and all the local people we met um, and welcomed in, and welcomed us into their house, fed us um, into yeah. their business places and made us feel welcome. Really appreciate it. You know who you are um, and you really made our time in India. So thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, so I think that's about it. Yeah, yeah. that's it. That's it for our time <laughs> in India too. So thanks for watching. And um, I will say one thing too for our Indian viewers please refrain from leaving negative comments about our pending um, crossing into Pakistan. It doesn't really align with our videos, so keep your comments yeah, to yourself. Keep it positive, guys. Yes. You're all really nice people, so just keep it positive. Yes. Um, but yeah, the next one, we're crossing to Pakistan and yep. continuing this awesome journey. Yes. So we'll cool. see you then. Yeah. Thanks, Thanks guys. Bye. See ya.